Good afternoon and welcome to the latest staff briefing here in AWP. First of all, can I thank you for taking the time uh, to listen to this briefing and also thank you for taking the time to be involved in last month's uh, briefing. Uh, I've had quite a lot of feedback uh, from that briefing uh, and we had very lively debates in various parts of the Trust. Hopefully where you're listening to this uh, briefing, members of the executive team are on hand to take questions, uh, hear feedback from last month, uh, take comments on some of the things that I want to say today. Uh, but one of the things I'd ask you to do is see it as it is. It's really important that we hear uh, what our staff are saying. So I'm in the Rivers Cafe at Froomside uh, at the moment, uh, our forensic unit in Bristol, um, and I can recommend the coffee. It's very good. I want to do four things uh, today if I can. I want to respond to the feedback we had uh, from last month. I want to bust a few myths because there seems to be quite a lot, probably more than usual, rumours flying around the Trust at the moment. And then I want to update you on some of the uh, latest news around the Trust direction, not least uh, in the light of the Secretary of State for Health uh, speech uh, earlier in the week. The first thing I want to do though is just to say thank you uh, again to all of our staff for the work that you do. Since the last briefing, um, I've done a number of things, but I, I worked a shift on Juniper Ward, which is our acute ward in uh, North Somerset. Um, I spent uh, quite a bit of uh, Wednesday evening on Ember Ward in Devizes. Um, and I have to say, I never, I never cease to be amazed at this high quality dedication of the work our staff are doing, particularly in pretty challenging circumstances. And uh, my shift on Juniper brought into sharp relief for me just how tough a gig it is working in, in our acute services. The other thing I wanted to acknowledge is I've, I've had a lot of feedback recently about some of the pressure in Bristol, uh, particularly since the changes following the letting of the new contract. Uh, and I just wanted to say to staff, we recognise the difficulties and challenges in some of our teams. Uh, work is in hand and we're working with the local management and the triumvirate uh, to ensure that we put uh, effective support in. Uh, and I want to meet with staff side members and hear firsthand what the concerns are. So as I say, I wanted to start off by just acknowledging the work that people are doing right across our trust and to say uh, thank you for your uh, perseverance and your, your absolute dedication. So just going back to last month and particularly uh, reflecting on some of the feedback that uh, we had. So we talked, or I talked a bit about the importance of really continuing to focus on quality and really starting to get beyond the tasks that we've undertaken and we undertake in the trust. You know, we, we improve our, our care planning and we address ligature points and so on. And that's really important. We've got to continue with that. But what, we need, we, what I want us to do is to make sure that we're thinking about how we ensure consistent standards right across the trust. So Andrew Dean, our Director of Nursing, is working with our Directors of Quality in each part of our trust to define what those standards mean in inpatient care, in our forensic services, in our community services. And I, I'm asking everybody to make sure we engage in the discussion around that. There will be workshops running across the trust that will help us to understand what we mean by those standards. So just to be clear, having consistent standards doesn't mean we want a one size fits all in every part of the trust. We want consistent standards. Uh, it may well be that the way we have to do things in Bristol differs from the way we do things in Baines, but what people can expect is that the service they receive will be of high quality, will meet the five domains, which incidentally we have reviewed and updated our IQ system to reflect those domains so we can understand exactly where we are in relation to those quality standards. But the way we do things locally might differ, but what we've got to use is use the whole trust as the means of ensuring that that local delivery is as good as it needs to be. Last year, we had as many as 46 people residing in places far from our geographical area. And I think everybody would acknowledge that people do well and do much better the closer they are to home. So we've been really working hard to ensure that we bring people back to the local area. We've recently commissioned an additional 17 beds, some in North Somerset, some in Bristol, to ensure that we can offer specialist help and support closer to where people live. Uh, and in, in, last week we had as few as six people out of our trust area. So that's really good improvement. But the thing that came out of last month's briefing was people were asking, so what's this thing about having to discharge patients to allow more needy patients in? 
uh, and, it, and it became uh, almost confusing. I think some people thought that what the Trust was trying to do was interrupt people's care pathway or uh, interrupt their care. So just to be clear, what I mean by that is I'm making the assumption that if somebody is in one of our inpatient wards for reasons other than their treatment at that time, i.e. they're waiting for a house or they're waiting for a placement or whatever, by definition, they're in a better position to move than somebody who is acutely unwell, being held in a police cell or being held in a place of safety or whatever. And what I want all of our wards to be thinking about is who, if need be, that is on our ward today that we would be prepared to try and accelerate their care pathway or get them to a more appropriate place more quickly in order that the person who is much more acutely ill can have access to our beds. So for those of you who uh, like to watch all things NHS, um, you will have noticed that the Secretary of State for Health, uh, Jeremy Hunt, uh, made a speech last week where he set out his thinking and his plans for our NHS going forward. He talked a lot about seven day working and the importance of ensuring we have seven day services. And I'm delighted that in many parts of our trust we do have seven day services, so thank you for those of you who contribute to that. He talked about the importance of uh, reducing weights and cancer treatments and so on. And it was, it was a compelling speech in terms of setting out his vision. In the speech itself, it made little, if any, mention of mental health. But I was fortunate enough to be at an event last week in London where the new care minister, uh, Alistair Burt, uh, talked to us directly as chief executives of mental health organisations about the, the government's priorities around mental health. And I'm delighted to say that they are prioritising mental health as a government. Uh, they're looking to see investment in child and adolescent mental health services. And I think most of us would recognise that that is a need in our local area. They're talking about investing in access to psychological therapies and primary care uh, and supporting young people with eating disorders. And what the Minister has said is that they will ensure that the money that they are intending to be spent in mental health is spent in mental health. Um, and they are talking about ensuring much greater parity between physical and mental health services. So that was, that was really encouraging. And in response to that, and, and, and as we have been working anyway, we are looking at strengthening our access to psychological therapy services in all parts of the Trust. Uh, we are looking to work with commissioners to identify how much further we could go with those kind of services. And we are currently working with partner organisations around us to compete for the provision of children's services. Because as a board, we believe that mental health should be a whole system of care, irrespective of age. As you'll know, we uh, complete a survey of our staff every year. And uh, I'm sure you've read uh, of the concern the board has about some uh, feedback that we got from last year's staff survey. Uh, and a bit of feedback was around bullying and harassment in our organisation. So of the work that was done in relation to bullying and harassment, uh, more than 50 people responded to the online survey and more than 40 people uh, contacted the independent consultant uh, directly uh, and were uh, offered interviews, etc. I'll publish the findings of that piece of work. But there's a couple of things I wanted to say at this stage. First of all, um, there was no evidence of staff-on-staff uh, -staff assaults or, or abuse. Um, there was no evidence of systemic bullying across the Trust, but there was clearly some uh, pockets of issues that we have to deal with, and I will publish uh, the findings of that piece of work uh, in the next few weeks. And I will also uh, be really clear about what we plan to do to address those issues uh, as a Trust. Having carried out the work and having committed to following it up, it doesn't end there. I think I want to really encourage people, if you believe or experience any sort of bullying or harassment in our trust, there's a hotline, the number will be on the screen, there are various ways that you can address that, but I'm really, really committed to ensuring that where we have issues of bullying, we deal with them, because the way you're treated in work is critical to the way we'll treat our service users that we serve every day.
And then finally, one of the things that was said to me last month and has been said to me on regular uh, occasions is um, one of the things that we might do as an organisation is thank people a little, a little bit more, maybe appreciate what people do a little bit more. We put a, a priority on appraisal. I think it's really important that people understand what's expected of them and get some feedback on their performance, at least on an annual basis. And again, we're seeing really good improvements in appraisal in many parts of the trust. So I'd, I'd really commend you to keep it up. And I think it's important if, if, it, if it were me, I would demand an appraisal because I really want to know how I'm doing. So if those of you who haven't been appraised in the last 12 months, I think you need to be demanding of your team leader and manager. And team leaders and managers, you need to be as demanding of your uh, line management uh, as well. Okay, so just quickly to recap, complete focus on quality and the outcomes of what we do. So we'll, we'll keep uh, a firm eye on that. Recognition that we've got some real challenges in and around the trust and that's going to continue. But we'll, we will work to ensure that we support people through that, where there are pressures raise them with us and we'll seek to uh, see what we can do. We'll continue our focus on managing people close to where they live and I think the contribution that our clinical staff make to that is really uh, important. Uh, and I'll publish the information around bullying. And again, thank you for all that you do and I look forward to next month's briefing and updating you further then. Thank you.